1734, Jonathan Edwards, Northampton, Massachusetts church, was in the midst of a revival that would spark the First Great Awakening. And one observer described it this way, it pleased God to display his free and sovereign mercy in the conversion of a great multitude of souls in a short space of time, turning them from a formal, cold, and careless profession of Christianity to the lively exercise of every Christian grace and the powerful practice of our holy religion. Well, in this first revival and all the subsequent revivals in history that we've looked at in the past couple of weeks, there emerges a distinct pattern. In the words of one author, God supernaturally transformed believers and non-believers in a church, a locale, a region, a nation, or even the world through sudden, intense enthusiasm for Christianity. People sense the presence of God powerfully with conviction, despair, contrition, repentance, and prayer came easily. And people thirsted for God's word and many authentic conversions occurred and fallen away believers were renewed. So three weeks ago we began to look at the periods of revival in our nation since its founding. And last week we ended with the Billy Graham Crusades in the 20th century, but that's not the end of revival in our nation, folks. After that we had a charismatic revival of the Pentecostal churches and the Jesus movement of the 1960s and 70s that forever changed our church culture in this country and, and really in the world. Now there were two pioneer churches in this revival that came out of the Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California. It began with just 25 people. Pastor Chuck Smith had a heart for a lost generation of hippies, disillusioned by the empty culture of free love, drugs, and the looming specter of the endless the, the Vietnam War. With this invitation to come as you are, to an informal setting, with contemporary music, familiar in style, yet theologically based, and his line-by-line -line preaching of the Bible, the church grew in just a few years to a 2,200-seat sanctuary in 1973, with three services. To do the math, that's 6,600 folks. And then, a couple of years after that, there were 4,000 at each service, 12,000. They were sitting in the aisles. Didn't make the sanctuary bigger, they just squeezed in, I guess. Now today, there are more than 1,500 Calvary chapels across the world, and eight of them are right here in Massachusetts. Well, the second church that came from this movement is the Vineyard, founded by John Wimber. I told you I'd tell you about John Wimber, right? Uh, he was a Calvary chapel pastor. Um, and he was also, uh, before his conversion, a music producer. And he was a musician, and he managed groups such as the Righteous Brothers. Remember the Righteous Brothers? Yeah. Unchained Melody, remember that? Yeah. yeah. So he had some big acts. I mean, he was, he was a California you know, hustler, a, a music producer out there. But Christ got a hold of him. And so he used these musical gifts that he had given to John Wimber to develop a distinctive worship style in these vineyard churches. And they're known for contemporary Christian music. Um, I'm just saying one of the well-known ones, Spirit Song. Now, Wimber and Smith, although they started out kind of together, they began to differ over the emphasis of their ministries. Smith believed in the expository preaching of the Bible that was paramount. Line by line, precept by precept, he taught the Bible. And they still do that in Calvary chapels today. But Wimber sought a charismatic direction of spiritual gifting and prophecy <coughs> and healing. He really wanted to emphasize the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so today there are over 2,400 vineyard churches in the world, and 10 of them are in eastern Massachusetts. And of course, right up here in Kingston, we have uh, the one that Don Andreessen founded and pastored until recently, but his son has taken over now. And then out of this movement came these big mega churches like Willow Creek in Chicago and Saddleback in California. And you know about Rick Warren, I think most people know his church. Now Calvary Chapel and the Vineyard also set the standard for contemporary Christian music. With their distinctive artists, they had you know, certain people that wrote for them, that sang for them, probably still do. And they also each founded publishing houses for music. One is Maranatha, you might have heard of Maranatha music, and the other, of course, is Vineyard music. And some of the well-known Maranatha titles are How Great Is Our God, Above All, I See the Lord as the Deer, In His Time, which we just sang, 
and we're going to sing the final hymn, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. We actually have some of these in our hymnals. <laughs> it's interesting. Because most of the hymnals up until recent years didn't have, it, have these songs in them. The hymn of preparation that we just sang was written by John Wimber. Now, Vineyard has a catalog of over 850 praise and worship songs. And they include longtime favorites, Change, Change My Heart, O God, which is a lovely ballad, and Come, Now is the Time to Worship. <coughs> I have to say that I think that era was the heyday of contemporary Christian music, because of what's going on today is nothing compared to those, as far as musically and theologically. They kind of lost a lot along the way. Now these revivals, we know, are centuries apart, and we're going back to the early 1700s, and now we're in the 21st century, but they share common characteristics. And that's typical, because who begins revival? It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit uses the same kind of work. The first thing that has to happen in a revival is that it has to be God's timing. We can't make revival happen. God says when it's going to happen. So all of these revivals, if you look at it, emerge at a time of spiritual and moral decline, either in an area or in the nation. And awakenings are usually preceded by a time of spiritual depression and apathy and gross sin, in which the majority of nominal Christians are hardly different from the members of the secular society. Churches seem to be asleep. An awakening may be God's means of preparing and strengthening his people for future challenges or trials coming. Now, if you look back at these, you know, I just want to do a little retrospective, putting this template on there. In Whitfield's time, the fervor of the initial awakening of Jonathan Edwards' era that I referenced at the beginning, we didn't talk about Edwards much before because it was really a local Massachusetts kind of revival. We were looking at bigger revivals. But you know, Edwards kind of began it, but by the time of Whitfield, the colonies were suffering under this yoke of oppression of England. England wanted to, you know, stomp out all of this dissent that was here. So that was what fomented it. In Finney's time, the abolition of slavery in the Civil War challenged the country socially and physically and mentally and spiritually. And then D.L. Moody's time, the burden of his heart was for the lost in the post-Civil War era. In Billy Sunday's time, you had the First World War, the Great Depression, and prohibition. Talk about big factors. And then in Billy Graham's time, the country was reeling from World War II, entering the Cold War, then the Korean conflict, the endless Vietnam War, and then with the Jesus Revolution, the challenges were rapidly changing in the culture of the American landscape with the Civil Rights Movement. Of course, Vietnam was still going on until the early 70s. Women's liberation, sexual revolution, the emerging drug culture, all of these things in these different time periods had its own tumult and were agents behind the, re the revivals that God fomented at that time. Now the perils of each of these times brought people to a second characteristic of revival, intense prayer. Revival begins first in the church as God puts a burden on the hearts of believers to long for and pray for revival. Then the third characteristic is the preaching and reading of God's word that brings deep conviction of sin and desire for Christ and the need for repentance and forgiveness. Believers are called to repent, not only for their personal sins, but for the sins of the nation. And the fourth is the Holy Spirit begins to take people into a spiritual depth that they cannot achieve on their own. There's powerful works of the Holy Spirit and healings and deliverances and prophetic words that mark a revival. And the fifth thing is the Holy Spirit reveals to sin-burdened hearts that consolation and deliverance can only come through Christ. Sixth, the power of the Holy Spirit poured out in revival. And then God begins to be praised and honored and glorified. And then seventh, revival produces lasting fruit of true conversions, not just you know, one-off people with ecstatic utterances for one day and then they go back to their old ways, but true conversions that last. And new ministries and missions and churches begin to crop up. 
And then finally, the whole purpose of revival is that we'll accomplish the purpose that God sent it for. In Whitfield's time, revival created the unity of the colonies to position us to become a nation for God. And Whitfield's preaching brought about a national identity that's forged in Christian identity. <coughs> now in one sermon, Whitfield is, is said to have cried out as an illustration. He said, Father Abraham, who do you have in heaven? Any Episcopalians? Uh, no. <laughs> any Presbyterians? No. Have you any independents or seceders? No. Have you any Methodists? No, no, no. Well, who do you have there? And Father Abraham answered, We don't know those names here. All who are here are Christians. And Whitfield answered, Oh, is this the case? Then God help us. God help us all to forget party names and to become Christians in deed and in truth. In Finney's time, the nation was being prepared to do what was necessary to eradicate the sin of slavery and other social sins. Now Finney put the responsibility at the door of every Christian. He said every member must work or quit. No honorary members in the kingdom of God. The obligation of each Christian is inescapable. Every child of God is to aim at being useful in the highest degree possible, preferring the interest of God's kingdom above all other interests. Slavery, temperance, vice, world peace, women's rights, Sabbath observance, prison reform, profanity, education, all of this came under Finney's penetrating gaze. And the fruits of these times were the beginning of many of our benevolent societies, including the American Bible Society, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the American Sunday School Union, the American Tract Society, the American Temperance Society, and Americans Home Missionary Society. D.L. Moody, he had a burning call to preach the gospel to people who resisted attending churches, and he brought innovation of holding meetings in unconventional spaces, in theaters, auditoriums, and sprawling circus tents. He did a lot. One of the lasting testaments is the Moody Bible in Institute in Chicago. From its very beginning, and I didn't know this until I was reading up on this, Moody Bible Institute trained scores of women to become evangelists and preachers and pastors. This is in the 1800s, folks. And then also pioneered people for inner city missionaries, trained missionaries, and correspondence students who couldn't afford to come to college could do it by mail. And the institute continues today with undergraduate and seminary degree programs. Billy Sunday's powerful preaching supported women's suffrage it called for an end to child labor. It unmasked the lie of evolution and was almost single-handedly responsible for the passage of prohibition. Now, the fruit of Billy Graham's ministry in Crusades is well known. He was a pastor of the presidents, is what he was called. He provided spiritual counsel to every president from Harry Truman to Barack Obama. He was also the pastor of the nations, reaching nearly 215 million people in more than 185 countries. And territories. The question I think for today, for today is, is God readying us for another revival now? Well, let's look at those eight characteristics I mentioned again and to kind of try to apply it here. The first thing is, does it look like God's timing for revival to you? Yeah. Is our nation and the world in a state of spiritual and moral decline? moving farther and farther away from what God has told us is best for us. Are there any indications that God is preparing us for a coming trial? Well, I urge you to think about these questions and to seek some answers for yourself. You know, I could certainly enumerate many, but I urge you to do your own research. This is something you have to own for yourself. Now, those who attended the What Does the Bible Say About workshops have got a head start on this. The second thing is, are we as individuals and as a church 
with other churches and as a nation being driven to our knees in prayer for revival. Some are. The seeking of revival is the aim of the Glory of God South Shore Prayer Movement, which our church has participated in from the very beginning. However, only a few in our church attend these prayer meetings, and I know it's because we don't like the music. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes we have to rise above what we don't like to let God work. We also have a monthly prayer meeting, and we've added another to pray specifically for our church and country, but only a handful, you know, the usual suspects is what we call ourselves, come to these meetings. I would say as a church, we're not seeking revival and prayer. The third thing is the preaching and the reading of God's word is the avenue to a deep relationship with Christ and the conviction that we need his transforming power through the unleashing of his Holy Spirit. So I submit the first to you, how am I doing with the preaching of the word? Good. Room for improvement. Good, good one, Linda. Good on you. Does it make you feel cozy? Or does it make you uncomfortable? I certainly feel uncomfortable when I have to write these sermons and see what I have to see to do it. Do the sermons challenge you to face the hard things? The unconfessed sin in your life? The things you hide from God. Good luck. Good luck with that. <laughs> the need to seek His will in prayer and His word. How you doing with your Bible reading? Again, only a portion of you engage regularly with the group on Sunday mornings to read and study the Bible together. It's a perfect tailor-made opportunity for you. There's a new men's Bible study group. Belinda has the faith read group on Thursday mornings. 8 o'clock in the morning, half an hour, of just reading the Bible. We're not commenting, we're just reading it. And Belinda and Pauline are shortly to launch a weekday women's Bible study group. So there's many opportunities here. And when you read the word together, you know, I, I'm not saying you don't read it at home, you know, maybe you do, maybe you read it as couples. When you read it in a group, and everyone in that group has been saved and they have the Holy Spirit, there is a, a rich and a depth to the richness and the depth to that that you don't get when you're alone. You can get insights from the Holy Spirit that you won't apprehend in your own. Now some in the group here are experiencing the fourth and fifth levels of revival. A deepening presence of the Holy Spirit and the grief of knowing there's nothing we can do on our own to change the miserable conditions we see around us. It has to be a mighty work of God through his spirit, through his body. What's his body? It's you and me. We're the body. We need to be enlivened and empowered by the spirit. Do you long for more of the spirit? I do. I pray for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. So what if God's choosing this time? to get us ready for a coming revival? Are there any indications of this being imminent? Is revival happening anywhere in our country? I would say yes. And it's happening in the area of our country that has fallen the farthest away from God's best for us. It's happening where the last revival movement happened and with these same churches. You might call it the second wave of the Jesus movement, I suppose. It's happening in California where the governor's excessive COVID edicts have all but shut down churches and have generated a recall election, by the way. And yet Calvary Chapel of Chino Hills stepped out in faith in June 2020 and baptized 1,200 people on the beach of Corona Del Mar in complete defiance. Sometimes you've got to defy laws and regulations that God is not sanctioned. Now this church, and actually, I think I told you a couple of months ago, the pastor of this church, Jack Hibbs, was here in Plymouth with a group from his church, three busloads of people. Now, this is, it's a bucket, you know, drop in the bucket with how many people they have in this congregation. Came here to Plymouth to find out what happened when the pilgrims came here. And 
so Paul Jaley had a guide of tour, and he asked me to participate. I told them about what happened on the voyage of the Mayflower. What happened when they got here. They came here all the way across the country to Plymouth because they wanted to reconnect with what we have on our doorstep, mm -hmm. what we have in our in our veins. This church started with a home Bible study of six people in 1990. Six people. That was the year my daughter was born, 30, 31 years ago. Six people. And now it has a congregation of over 5,000 people. If that ain't revival, I guess, you know, well, I don't know what is. And Pastor Greg Laurie. Now, how many of you get Joyce's communication on every day? You're going to find that there's, Greg Laurie is on there every morning now with a great biblical devotion. Well, he's the founder of Harvest Ministries. He came to faith under the teaching of Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel. And he had a long friendship with Billy Graham. He actually, you know, helped Billy Graham. He wrote speeches, he helped with sermon writing, he did a lot with Billy Graham's organization. He's on the uh, board of directors of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, I think, even today. <coughs> now, Harvest Church is located in Irvine, California, okay? It has five satellite locations, including two, I believe, in Hawaii. Over 15,000 members. And the last SoCal Harvest Crusade that was held in 2019 at the Anaheim Football Stadium drew 100,000 people. Do you think people are hungry for the Lord? So I would say, yeah, revival's happening. And if it can start in California, why not here in Plymouth, where it all began, with the revival of 100 people in 1620? It's going to take our total commitment and courage, just like it did with the pilgrims. Just like what Finney said. No room for part-time Christians here. Like Abraham, our ancestors of faith, the pilgrims, are called to go to an unknown land that the Lord would show them. You've been on the Mayflower, right? How would you fancy coming across on that little boat with a hundred people and not even sure you're going to get here? Because the Lord told you to come. Maybe today we're more like Jonah, the reluctant prophet. This is what we read. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God's heart was burned, burdened for the sins of the people of Nineveh. And he called Jonah to go and give him his warning. Now Nineveh, if you know anything about the geography of Israel, Israel's all the way over to the east side of the Mediterranean Sea. Nineveh is 725 miles east of there. But Jonah disobeyed God and tried to put as much distance between himself and the Ninevites and as if it were possible from God by boarding a ship in Tarshish, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean, to go 3,000 miles, he was, he was in Joppa, I'm sorry, to go to, go to Tarshish, 3,000 miles to the west in what is now Spain, the edge of the world. So what about you? Where is your Tarshish? Where do you go and what do you do, either in your head or physically, to run away from what you don't want to deal with, what you don't want to face? Do you lose yourself in your work, in your pleasures, in your distractions? In your avoidances? Well, we all know what happened to Jonah when he tried to cut and run to Tarshish, don't we? I don't need to tell you that part of the story, but he knows that. Ultimately, he went to Nineveh. And this is what it says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And so Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 
40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the Ninevites believed God. The fast was proclaimed. All of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Sisters and brothers in Christ, Though we long to hunker down in Tarshish, it's a mirage. We live in Nineveh. Who do you think God's sending to this generation with his warning? You and me. This is no time to sail away on a sea of dreams. God is calling us into the grit, the grime, and the darkness that's thickening all around us to bring the washing of his word and the light of his salvation to those who are perishing. Some of them are even our own families. God calls. If we don't answer, he may give us a second chance. But as Jonah found out, it's much better to answer the first one. Let's pray. Father God, you search every heart. You know every thought and desire. You've made known to us in your word your one desire for us, to love you wholeheartedly, with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Yet we're not capable of such love. Sin divides our hearts between what we know we should do and what we want to do that is not good for us. And we are torn between our love for you and for our sins. Father, this morning we cry out to you we claim your promise to give us undivided hearts and to put a righteous spirit in us so that we can truly love as you love us. We don't want to be reluctant prophets like Jonah. We long to take up the call to be the prophets of your word in season with the courage and conviction and power and joy of Whitfield and Finney and Moody and Sunday and Graham and the modern day voices in the wilderness. You call to your church today, to us today. Sleeper, awake. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Father, waken your church from our comfortable slumber. Remove the blinders from our eyes so we'll see that unlike Jonah, we're not being sent to Nineveh, we live in Nineveh. We have no choice to go anywhere else. Yes, it's safe and comforting in here with each other. But you send us out there, into the grit, grime, the darkness that's thickening all around us, to bring the washing of your word, the light of your salvation to those who are perishing. <coughs> you do not send us alone. We're surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses who come before us, and those who are in heaven cheering us on. We walk together in the power of your spirit, and we are one in the body of Christ. Revive us again, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Jesus said, do not worry. <laughs>